Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, he's still at the top of the box office after four weeks in theaters, it's Arturo Zurita. I'm doing this, and I said I wasn't going to do this. I'm in front of, I'm in front that of lasted everyone. like two weeks. It lasted two weeks after making fun of everyone who did that. No, I'm excited to be here, super scruffy as can be. I'm trying to... This place that I get my, my hair cut at, can't say it or else someone's going to show up there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like a $40 haircut, but he does such a good job, right? Mm-hmm. But he does the beard and everything. Ooh. So so it's like, I want it to grow. Yeah. I got to get my money's worth. So right now, <laughs> looking look, look like extra scruffy and stuff. But um, Yeah, I've never got that professional beard. beard treatment before. I mean, oh, not that I goodness. really need it. No, but... it, it does not matter. I don't care if you got one hair. You got to go. When that man comes out with the Sweeney Todd thing, it just he's like... The first time that I had gone there, it was like one of these seats, right? I'm used yeah. to this at Grey Clips. <laughs> yeah. I ever know this man went, all right, get back. Like, kicked the thing. Boom. Popped all the way to the back. He went. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's nice. But treat I'm glad. Treat yourself a little bit. Yeah, treat yourself. Exactly. But I'm glad to be here. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yes. Uh, in a little bit, we'll be discussing whether or not March is the new February, is the new January. I think so. And uh, we also have some to- topics for yay or nay, including John Favreau's Star Wars series and the Sopranos prequel. But first, no, not for it. We're starting the way we start every week on the intercut art. What you been watching? We watched something that I know we both watched. So let me let me let me start off with something I've been listening to. Your boy Logic's got a new album. Do you listen to Logic? Yeah, uh, not so much. It, I'm going to say say he's more your boy than my boy. No, uh, not, he's not even my boy either, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem with Logic. Actually, yeah. I'm working on a video on him as well, but um, it, any experience with the man? Not really. I mean, that, Met that, him, that, ate that with one him? song blew up that was about mental health. And I, I'm oh, glad, the 1800 song? I'm glad that like that's a topic that's in the news. I don't think the song was that great. You're you not know? allowed to say that. I know. Bro, you're um, not al- you're not allowed to say that. I can't. Why are you thing. Why are you pro suicide? Yeah, exactly. That's oh, I know the you're talking about the song. That I want to take right here, right yeah. now. I know you're talking pro about the suicide. song and how it is, but no, 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 you cannot critique it because you're pro suicide. <laughs> That's probably the biggest thing uh, on Logic. It's someone said the word the other day. Do you remember when you talked about that you went to go see a comedy special, but the comedy special wasn't funny? What was the word that you said? Clapter. It's the word that I think I want to say that Seth Meyers and Tina Fey used this to talk about. uh, Yeah, but I'll (laughs) I'll claim it. I'll claim it. (laughs) Clapter. It's when you like clap because you agree with something, but you're not really like laughing along with the comedy bit. There you go. That so that that type of thing. But I heard it. The word was humblecore. It's this new wave of music. And and for those of you who think I'm coming at it negative, I love Chance the Rapper. I love, adore Chance the Rapper. Mm -hmm. Obviously, right? He kind of falls into this as well. That idea oh, yeah. of when you're doing positive, encouraging K Love music, that anyone who disses you, or anyone who critiques you, my bad, anyone who critiques you, it's see, anyone who critiques you, it's automatically a diss. Right. Because right. when you're so positive and encouraging, if anybody says anything bad, like to critique and say something about the music, all of a sudden it's no. You're you're bashing you're positivity. You're just a hater. You're negative, and that's a whole discussion for a whole other day. That humble court thing and that. Uh, that thing that it puts you in, but everything should be critiqued. Yeah. And I always find it interesting because the artists themselves critique it. Mm-hmm. Now, my only biggest critique on on, uh, on Logic is the fact that he does get influenced a lot. And I think that's a whole other discussion we can have about how influenced I be. It's a video I'm going to make. I'm already ready for that Rat Pack to come at me, but I'll say this. I'll keep it positive. Got a new one. I am more a mixtape Logic than I am an album Logic. And uh, he had Rick and Morty in this. If you haven't heard it, I would listen to it. I, okay. I I think it's his best project for me. I liked it. Is a lot of it influenced from other artists? A thousand percent. But you know, like when you hear a really good cover, <laughs> that's what this album was for me. I think All it's right. really good. My favorites would be uh, Yuck, because he disses someone by also saying, "But I don't want to diss you, so I'm gonna diss you." But I have full respect for you, so I'm gonna show you no respect. <laughs> I think it's funny. I think it's good. And the second half of a song called Midnight, I want to say. But only the second half. Only, yeah. If you listen to it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll say it one more time. The second half of Midnight. Cool. The second half. It's dope. Give it a listen. It's out everywhere. 
Sweet. Uh, one thing that I've been watching that I don't think you have quite yet caught up with, uh, Atlanta Love. Season 2. Oh, yeah. Uh, season Doesn't 2 matter. is back on FX. It's two episodes deep right now. The Donald Glover show, and it is as esoteric and weird but hilarious as ever. Uh, the first episode featured Cat Williams as an alligator man who's uh, Ern's uncle. And the second episode featured a rapper that sort of resembles Chance the Rapper, but it's Stop. definitely, definitely, it's definitely worth uh, catching up with it. It's, I think, I was talking about this with some friends, and you know, Atlanta isn't a show that makes me laugh a lot. I'd say maybe I laugh three, four times per episode, but when mm -hmm. I laugh at Atlanta, it is like that deep it builds belly it up. laugh. Yeah, like I'm, I'm like choking while I'm laughing. The the invisible car moment from the first season is maybe uh -huh. the funniest thing that I saw all 2000, 2016. <laughs> so uh, I think there's a lot of really great stuff in Atlanta, whether it's the what flavor is hot Cheetos joke or <laughs> or any of the stuff that did that was going on with um, Earn and Paperboy on speakerphone. The thing, you'll know it when you see it. Yeah. I think it's a great show. It's maybe my favorite show that's on regular TV right now. So you're saying it's better than American? Better. Why are you thinking? Oh, American Vandal. Oh, yeah, better uh, on regular TV. That's why I had to throw that one out okay. there. Okay. So, but American a, Vandal still still a, is king. Yeah, I mean, I. I Personally, I like BoJack more too. But oh yeah, well, I know that. I yeah. thought I was gonna have to show you the divorce papers though <laughs> for the other one. Listen to to me. The my only thing with the, and do you know like when you when you save a piece of cake, yeah, or like a candy bar or ice cream or whatever it is that you have in the fridge and and you want to eat it but you know you just want to save it. Yeah, you know it'll be better later. It's not even that it's better late. I just don't want it to go away. That's me with Atlanta. Right, I don't right. want to watch it and then because right now I can hold the experience of of Childish Gambino's show that is so hyped up, who I adore, mm -hmm. it's still fresh for me. It's weird, I know. It's I know, I, I get it. You, get, you get what I'm talking you, about. You don't want to not have it available to you anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've both been watching something else, though. A Wrinkle in Time. It is the latest big Disney release, the latest from director Ava DuVernay. This one stars uh, newcomer Storm Reed as mm -hmm. a uh, young girl who is taken across the galaxy or whatever have you through this wrinkle in time and the Tesseract and other stuff that I didn't quite understand, even though this was a kid's movie. Uh, it also has Oprah Winfrey, Reese Witherspoon, and Mindy Kaling as the misses who help guide Storm Reed's character on this journey. And uh, as you were, we were talking about a little bit earlier on your Patreon after show, yep. Asa Butterfield Jr.? Asa Butterfield Jr., who would have known? Ender's Game did not end. Yeah. He it just, just went back in time and came out as this kid. Weirdest thing. And then um, a, a six-year-old who... who? No, I mean, that kid was 45 years old. Is the villain of the movie? <laughs> that kid is 45 years old. I don't care what anyone tells me. That man, that man has two master degrees. <laughs> that kid was more adult. That kid was more adult than any adult in the movie. Yeah, I mean, when he, did he shake? He's super well spoken and stuff. He Very well spoken. Uh, I mean, he worked for what they needed. I mean, we're gonna get into some spoilery details here. Yeah, it's later a, on, but yeah, it's a children's movie, and there's not really a whole lot you can spoil. The book's been yeah, especially out. when it's. <laughs> I was about to say that book's been out. Yeah, so it's, um, it's not a whole lot to initial ruin thoughts here. Um, so I'll say this: I have been a fan of Ava DuVernay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not someone who stands for her necessarily, but I thought both 13th and Selma are really solid and somewhat underrated films. Um, mm -hmm. So I was excited to see her take on a bigger scale. 100 mil, first first African-American woman to get 100 mil. And you guys know I'm not all up on those statistics and trying to like make something big, but when there's only been five, four women, yeah, this is the first time one of them is black, so like... Yeah, I mean, there, hey, I'm not one to make a big deal over something. There's times but... where there's the ESPN like first time ever statistics where it's like first time ever where somebody was did this for eight minutes in the this third the, quarter. This is the first at bat after taking a poop twenty minutes prior. While yeah, but but this bubble. is like a legitimate first. You know, this is a, a this first is like time a, a black woman deal. got this kind of budget is actually a big deal. Right, and, um, and I hope that it gets to a point where it ain't it ain't a big deal. Exactly. Uh, we so I think talking in terms of the budget, I think. 
she handled the the production design aspects of it really admirably. I thought this was a beautiful looking movie, um, from its costumes to its sets to the the ways that it kind of had these like co the color palette. I really enjoyed too. Yeah, just about everything else didn't really work that well for me. Here, right? All right, so I think it's the indie effect. What we've talked about, where you get that indie director mm -hmm. who's got that space and then goes on to something bigger, and very few can handle it. Now, I cannot blame her mm -hmm. because it is based off source material, right? right? Um, Although it is source material that she apparently pitched Disney on uh, her vision of. Well, that's fair, but but I see it the same with Ryan Coogler in Black Panther. Right, and obviously, right. I like Black Panther more. Different genre, but, but still uh, a better film in my opinion. Yeah. In Black Panther, I feel the best parts of Black Panther... We've said it. Wasn't Black Panther. <laughs> it's not the action. It's not any of that stuff. It's whenever he had those intimate moments of dialogue, especially with Killmonger. It's right. those moments where you could feel like, oh, this ain't just personal. This literally is personal. They're talking about Oakland right now where he was raised. I feel like the, the most intimate parts are whenever she had the girl. And I call it the, not Arya, Sansa, the Sansa effect. Mm-hmm. You know, like Sansa in Game of Thrones. Right. In the book, it's all internal stuff that she's going through. So when you're reading it, Right, it, that medium works better of being able to understand the mindset and what she's going through. And then when you see Sansa in the show, the joke was for the first couple of seasons, she's so boring. Mm -hmm. But that's because everything's happening internally. Right, right. That's this character. Yeah. Everything happens internally for her. And there were moments where it came out, that moment about the, are you ready to find your dad? Yeah, but what if I find him and he don't? I was like, that. honestly, look, I didn't like this movie, but I'm going to give credit when credit's due. When she hit him with that line, mm -hmm. what if she doesn't want to find me? I was like... Yeah, look, so there are moments here that I do moments. actually think work. Um, a Storm Reed's whole, like, journey with her father and the, yeah. the hesitance of her. I think a lot of kids' movies do this whole, like, dead or missing parent thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's become a cliche, but I think it was done effectively and in a kind of different way here. There's sort of um, a lot of kids' movies are about you know, believing in yourself. But this mm -hmm. was a little bit different in that it was more acknowledging that you're not perfect, acknowledging that you have faults, yeah. and still being able to overcome them. So in that way, I thought it was really good it, it, as a message for children. It, it's just... Accept your it's faults. All, yeah, accepting your faults. It's just Be rabbit at like 8 Mile. <laughs> it's just all the like fantasy stuff that surrounded it didn't really add up for me. There was no uh, logic that came together for me it's suddenly right. they're, suddenly they're you know hopping from planet to planet and the next she's like climbing upstairs because she has a magnifying glass exactly yeah. <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong it looks cool and i'm sure that again it's, it's a kid's movie uh from a kid's perspective it just looks magical it's wonderful i can guarantee you i can go back and watch anything uh i know um never ending story yeah I know that was a big influence for a lot of the people who were on the film. They had mentioned it uh, in their interviews. I'm sure if we watch that, you're going to be like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's like the logic for a kid is completely different. And it definitely right. is a kid's movie. You can yeah. see it from the dialogue and everything. It's from the perspective of a kid. Yeah, so it's not a it's family like, movie. It yeah, is a kid's movie. Yeah, that cannot be ignored. Uh, I'll say this about Ava. I'm, a, I'm becoming a bigger fan of her. Really? Even though you didn't like this movie so much, you, you became a bigger fan of her for yeah, it. Yeah, um, and I, it's not because of the movie. Mm -hmm. It's She did an interview with The Breakfast Club, and I loved the way she discussed it. I loved the way that she was talking about the movie, saying that, of course, it's, it's, for, it's, for, it's for families. And I love how she said, it's like, well, do you feel like there's a, a thing against Black Panther? She says, I don't care about that. I'm happy for Black Panther. Yeah. She says, if this movie doesn't, blow up in the box office that's fine i hope they catch it later at home because it's meant for the families who can't even go out to the theater i was like she knows what's up yeah and right, she, I'm that's be... one of the reasons she's also a big netflix person is she's she's all about access i remember when you told me about the publicist thing and, I, and i'm so upset that she overhyped 10 Chlor uh, the chlorophyll paradox uh, i was a little upset but i would say that i was like no she knows she's she's very very smart she was even talking about they asked her about like do you see yourself as an activist and she was like it's like, I do, but I know what happens when you say that word. Yeah. And there's other connotations. I was like, okay. Because usually some people want to take labels and they go, mm -mm, I don't care if it has negative connotations. That's the point. You cannot have connotations. But she's so nuanced. She's, she's very real. She definitely knows 
the world she's operating in. And I think if you watch her, her documentary 13th, that's proof of that. Like this is, you know, a lot of times you see documentaries that do have some kind of a political leaning and it's so it's so favored in one direction that you don't necessarily uh, get the nuance of it. But 13th is something that wants to deal with the nuance. Yeah. She even had mentioned that in the interview. They're like, what did you expect to get out of the, your movie 13th? And she said, well, I expected something, but then in the world when things went differently, she almost felt like, not that the movie was a failure, not that mm-hmm. it's irrelevant, but the way that she talked about it, and again, I highly recommend the interviews, the Breakfast Club interview. You guys, I'm sure you've heard of the Breakfast Club. Just search up Ava. She'll pop up. Definitely worth watching. I liked, I liked how she spoke about it. Like you said, she is straightforward. She will tell you, yeah, this movie could have done better. Yes, this. Yes, that. Yes, I work with what I got. She's one of those directors where even if you don't like the movie, I want to be on an Ava DuVernay set. It just, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, there's that seems, scene where she they She seems got, like a pretty delightful person. Right? And you, just, you just want some of her energy to yeah. rub off. So I, She seems like inspirational in a way. 1,000%. Yeah, I right. feel like I would feel good at my job if she told me I was doing well. Inspirational without those people who try to come off as being inspirational. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to come here and I am going to say things in a manner... Ashley Judd, she like, she, she'll just, she'll do. Yeah. She'll do. She says, do you want to know how you get other people to like you? It's not by going out and demanding them and giving speeches. I'm being nice. Be nice. <laughs> and they're going to go, wow, that was, I feel, and then they're nice. And then they're nice to other people. And they're, that's how I feel she is. I, I think she's a really cool person. In terms of the movie, again, still looking at it. Kids movie, but I still think that doesn't give it reasons for a lot of the logic that it doesn't build up on. Because we, when we say kids to family movies, I wish it leaned more on the family side. I yeah. do think that the the whole, I'm forgetting Meg. I remember it as being Meg because she gets bullied at school. Yeah. And they treat her like Meg from Family Guy. Yeah. I feel like if they would have really focused more on that story, and like you said, it's all of the outside elements, the fantastical parts that it's sort of like. Whatever. Who cares? Yeah, I don't yeah. need to see yada, yada, Reese yada. Witherspoon turn into with this flying green Pokemon. I do not care about that. The moments where they have that little girl like really contemplating, did my dad leave me because mm-hmm. of me? The moments where they had that little boy, even though he was a little over the top sometimes, like dealing with his adoption stuff and other people talking bad. It's whenever they had the nuanced points that weren't so in your face of like, be good and everything will be great. Where I'm like... Yeah, this might be one... If you're a parent, you might want to put it on and leave the room and let just let your kids enjoy it on their own. Because cause it's good. It's got a great message. Yeah, it's got a great message. There's nothing really you got to worry about here. I yeah. do think some kids might be a little bored. There's not like a lot of humor in this one, but uh, mm-hmm. it's pretty colors. I yeah, like the colors. but uh, definitely, like they've said, it's about having representation for a black girl. And mm-hmm. I and they definitely focus on that. Her hair is brought up multiple times. Yeah, her hair is a really interesting uh, plot point in this mm-hmm. movie. It is actually a plot point. Yeah, uh, and I think it's not done in a way that's heavy-handed either. I think if you understand what they're going for, you get it. And if you don't understand it, it's yeah. not really going to be something that's annoying or distracting. Right. I I got exactly why they were mentioning that. I mm-hmm. knew it one thousand percent because it's always the girl has the most prettiest hair, and it's not just that they're proud of it. They treat that hair, Rapunzel treats that hair like it makes her better than everybody else, mm-hmm. right? And that's what that's what the norm is. Her hair means she's better than you. <laughs> so I thought it was good to have that perspective in the movie, even though they deliver it with the cringiest kid in the world. Asa Butterfield Jr. that we were talking about, this kid might as well have just drooled. Might as well have just walked around with a bucket for this kid. Yeah, he was a little bit of like Mac- Manic Pixie Dream Boy. Holy smoke. I love... And one thousand percent. I also love the like attempt at character development with him. Like, I'm gonna go talk to my dad. The now. dad? Stop, kid. Remember, what, there's no character development when the when the first line that he gets is, "Why are you here? I don't know. Something told me to be here, and I am. Am I wrong? Yeah. No. He he's. There That's why I thought he was possessed. No yeah. I thought he was possessed. Uh, did you like that little kid? I I wish I had his name. I, sh- I I'm gonna look it up real quick. Uh, but the you got kid an ARP who... card. You ain't a little kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> old man baby. Did you like old man I... baby? Like, I think he's adorable and cute for what he was going for. I think he's a theater kid more than a movie kid. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Very like, expressive. Um... Too expressive for a movie. 
and and also so good at enunciating in a way that's like, are you are you real? I felt at a certain point the way he was sitting, the way he was dressed. It is not to say anything, but there's no there's no doubt. Gay people dress better than than straight people. Look, look at what I'm wearing right now, right? So I felt like that was almost the nod. I could just be overreaching it. That's fine. I, I would admit it. But I felt that, that they were sort of alluding to that. Like, what's the what's the gay representation we can put in here, but very subtly? And I felt that that's maybe what they were alluding to. Maybe I'm overseeing it. But I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I'm sure yeah. some people will say that's propaganda. Other people will say I'm looking too into it. But I felt that's why, that's why they gave him that character. That's why they dressed him the way they did and everything. Right. I, I could see that. Uh, Derek McCabe, for what it's worth, is the, the child's name. I mean, like, I think that it was kind of interesting to also give a child the role of a villain in a children's movie. Okay, so here's what I was confused about. He wasn't actually the bad guy. He gets possessed. Yes, yes. But do not get me wrong. I wrote in my notes, WTF, he's the bad guy? Yeah. Uh, I will say this. If he ended up being the bad guy, <laughs> I'm recommending this movie. I'm yeah, not no, kidding. That would be I a put, lot right, cooler. That would right? be a lot cooler. That last cop out when it turns out that he's actually being possessed, I was like, oh, what the heck? I felt that they didn't go that way because he's adopted in the movie. Yeah. And uh, the movie The Orphan already has like established <laughs> in some people's minds to never adopt a kid ever again. So Disney can't yeah, do something like that. Yeah, might not be the best Disney. Might not be the best thing. Yeah. Duvernay positive message. But t- <laughs> tell me, tell me that wouldn't be. That would have been some dope stuff. Oh right yeah, now. it would have been dope, and the movie would have probably been like R-rated and kids, a, kid, and kids done kids by Werner Herzog or something. <laughs> that Lars would have made Trier. this movie insane. Yeah, I, I would have been cool, but that yeah, not the movie we got. The movie we mm-hmm. got is not for us, and uh, that's, not for that's us, okay. That's fine. Yeah. So we're gonna move on to yay or nay, the segment where we take a look at the latest happenings in the entertainment industry, starting with what else? Star Wars. It feels like every other week we're starting yay or nay with Star Wars. Every morning. Disney, <laughs> Disney keeps announcing franchises and spin-offs and trilogies, and you get a movie and you get a movie. Disney's basically Oprah now. Uh, Practically. But they are now giving John Favreau, the director of Iron Man's one and two his own Star Wars series. The series will be premiering on their yet to be uh, delivered streaming service called That One Art. <laughs> what did I say? Uh, and it's going to be a episodic series, not a series of movies. So, uh, But it's a li- live action, so not Clone Wars style. This is our first legitimate Star Wars TV show, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so John Favreau is writing it as well as producing it. Oh, that, oh. Art, yay okay. or nay, you're in favor of John Favreau taking the helm on this project. Yay. Boy, we covered this a month ago, man. Did <laughs> I not say? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, they're putting all the pieces in place Hire to get me. everybody on their Netflix a competitor service. I said they were going to take away the Netflix competition by starting their own streaming service, but you got to have something big. What is bigger than a Star Wars series? Live action like we've never had before? Right. And I'm 1,000% with John Favreau. John Favreau gave us Iron Man. John Favreau's yeah. dope. And did you see the picture? What picture? Buddy. Chance? Chance put up? What would I do? I haven't seen this. Tell me. All right. I know you'll pop it up and post. There is a picture that Chance posted up. It's him just chilling in a freaking hotel, maybe a studio. Hans? Pharrell? Favreau? Uh-oh. Now, it could be Lion King. Some people have said uh, it's right, Lion right, King. Right, because he's working be... on Lion King. Exactly. Favreau's working on Lion King. I'm pretty sure Hans is doing the score. He did the original for, for, for Lion King. So it's probably that. Don't get me wrong. It's probably that, which I'm also really excited about because uh, Black Panther's score was fantastic. So if Disney keeps this up... <laughs> if Chance does the entire album for the Lion Ooh. King... Yo. Just like... Just like Kendrick did it all about like power and coming up and taking responsibility for Black Panther. If Chance does a whole like got that whole positivity gospel birth thing into your birthright thing. If it's like a freaking ultralight beam, just entire album. Are you feeling it? 
Yeah, man. And I could see that working with Lion King, too. For the Exactly. Buddy. Wait, but Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> Freaking Star Wars moved to... I've never been so excited for a long... I was the first to diss live-action Lion King. Gambino's in it. Yeah, man. Gambino's Simba. <laughs> so, we're yay on the Lion King movie. That's <laughs> not even part of this news segment. Um, I'm also yay for John Favreau, yeah. I'm yeah, I mean, like, John I, I, John, I like for John Favreau a lot. He's good. Um, what? Mate, I'll go. I'm gonna go nay. I'm gonna go to nay. J- you can't take that back. <laughs> you know how the rules of this work, of this show work. John Favreau, I I like him a lot as a filmmaker. I don't think he's worked in TV before, uh, so that's one thing that's like, all right, we needs to be seen, needs to be proven, and I don't know. I think there's just so many people out there. I'm curious why they went to someone who's so... It it does seem in step with what they've been doing recently by getting rid of these new filmmakers and bringing on veterans. They're they're going with, like, established names. I don't like that. Yeah, yeah. and I I just think I'd be more excited if it was somebody like, uh, you know, uh, Jan Demange or or somebody new. I don't know. Even Ava Ava DuVernay, who just says she's not interested in doing a Star Wars. Yeah, she would say she... Yeah. I... I... (sighs) I agree. Getting the Game of Thrones guys to go from right. TV to movies, and then getting and the movie guy to come to do TV, that's a little weird. I was weird. that too. That is a little weird, but... A little weird. I mean, John Favreau did Iron Man, man. He did Jungle Book. Yeah. Now he's doing, now he's doing Lion King. Yeah. I feel like and he can still help me. And you said producer. Yes, in writing and producing. I'm uh, assuming he'll probably direct at least the pilot, knowing who he is, but who knows. I mean, yeah, and that's the thing, you know, every time they cast, or no, excuse me, every time they enlist another white guy as a writer or director, there's always that drumbeat of, like, why do they hire so many white guys? And it's like, you know, each one of them is a worthy hire. It's just, like, the totality of it. Yeah. That's, like, it'd be cool to get some other visions in there. Oh, yeah, um, so it's like, so. yeah, it, my problem is not really with Favreau so much as it's, like, I'd like to see something a little more out of left field. Right. Partially because I'm not the biggest Star Wars person. Like, it, that's why I was so excited for the original prospect of the Solo movie because I'm really into uh, those directors who... Why am I forgetting their Stop. name right now? Logan... Or Miller and Lord. Stop. Yeah, Lord Dude, and Miller. That still hurts, man. No, yeah. li- every... If I didn't say it before, I'm going to say it again. The Solo trailer is one of the worst shows I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it is really bad, and it's worse when you see it in a theater. Yeah. No, it, like, it's, it's... I'm, like, borderline... If... I'm not as it's attached not to Star Wars as other people are, but if I was, I'd be really mad. I don't understand how people aren't. I'd be really upset. I think they are. I think it's been. I think is, people is it? Are, are okay, I haven't been so keeping concerned. up with it. Is it? Oh man, yeah. that is bad, dude. I will say this. Why does Favreau look like a cameraman? <laughs> Am I wrong? Every he time used to I be see like John, a, like a skinny dude in swingers. I don't know how that happened. It's not even. Th- it's just like Favreau's. Like we said. All these movies, all these crazy projects. But you look at him and it's like, nah. Like to an ordinary dude. Like we know him. Yeah, yeah. We know him. Right? But anybody else would be like, no, that's the guy in Chef eating a bunch of stuff. He's <laughs> like a cameraman or something. Yeah, he doesn't look like an auteur. Right? Yeah. Exactly. It's crazy to me. Uh, the Sopranos is potentially coming back in a prequel movie. Creator David Chase has been sitting oh, on an idea. Movie. For a script, uh, the script's called The Many Saints of New- Newark, not New York, uh, and it, ta- it talks thing. about the <laughs> riots that were going on in New York, in Newark, why do I keep doing that, in Newark, New thing. Jersey, in the 60s, between uh, the African Americans and the Italian Americans there, oh. uh, so, and which gave birth to a lot of the New Jersey mob families. Art, yay or nay, you're interested in a prequel movie to The Sopranos. I like the fact that it's a movie. Yeah. If anything, so it's not going to be anything that can be elongated, and if people aren't riding with it, they still got to be like, "Well, shoot, we still got eight more weeks." <laughs> you finished The Sopranos? Uh, I've I've skipped episodes, but I've seen both the beginning and the ending. Of okay, it. I've seen. Well, everyone, there is no end. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen when they pulled the plug out from the TV. Exactly. Uh, I've yet to catch up with all of it, but I have HBO. Yeah. I feel like, do you pay for HBO and like not even use it? I mean, my parents like, pay for HBO. Like you, 
bro, I've been paying for HBO. I'm just like waiting for like Silicon Valley to come on. And I'm like, <laughs> there has been five months that I've been giving them money and I haven't even used it at all. <laughs> but um, I'm a little iffy because I feel like what made The Sopranos was the performances. Right. Some people have said that they are bringing back some actors. A lot of them have said it's just going to be the characters that are coming back, like a young Tony Soprano. Yeah, so that's Because the it's thing. a prequel. Um, so, Tony uh... in, so Tony in the first episode talks about how he feels like he's coming in at the end. The end of this like era of mob. Uh, oh, okay, that's whatever. pretty cool. That's so, kind of cool, though. So this was essentially like the beginning, right? Uh, and it, Tony's father looms large over the show, uh, although he's never appears as a character on the show. So it, it'd be interesting to see if that's the way they want to do it. Yeah. I think, you know, I'm totally for this as long, like, I, I like Better Call Saul. I don't want this to be Better Call Saul. Okay. I don't want this to be, let's see how the pieces fit in nicely with Breaking Bad. I, I, I think that there's a really interesting story that can be like tangentially related to what we saw in The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. We can see a Soprano family. The way that like The Godfather 2. Ah, uh, why'd you take has, it away? I was, I was, that's how I wanted to end I, it. I, think I, yes. think I saw that going into your head. Did you see, did you see what it hit? I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Right? That's the perfect yeah. example of something being... Godfather 2 is better than Godfather 1. It's related, but it's not like changing your opinions of the first one. And If they Godfather 2 it, which, again, Italian prequel... Dude, if they Godfather 2 it, that would be some insane stuff. Because, first of all, if anyone still thinks that the Godfather Part 1 is better than the Godfather Part... Y'all lying. <laughs> y'all lying. But... Uh, that's that's why I'll give them the yay. Just because I've seen it done in the past, so I have something to be like, okay, maybe. Even though yeah. that was movie to movie, this is series to series to movie, so it's a bit different. So I'd be interested in how they handle it. Yeah, and I, I think David Chase is the guy capable of doing this kind of interesting project. So I, I'm curious to see what he goes with. Down for it. Kristen Wiig, the very famous SNL alum who for has it. appeared in many. <laughs> who's appeared in many comedy up. movies is switching it up by being the by playing the villain yep. in the upcoming Wonder Woman 2. She's been cast to play Cheetah. I won't delay it anymore. Art, yay or nay? You already, I already said it, dude. Stop. 1,000%. 1,000%. 1,000%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, she's a great actress. Like, let's not put her in a box skeleton of comedian. Twins. Yeah, skeleton twin. She's Welcome great. Welcome to in. me. Welcome to me. She's amazing. And I think even her small part in Mother is really, really good. You know? Yes, it is. And uh, but I think we also do this thing where we try to say that, oh, comedians are comedians and actors no. are actors. No. And sometimes comedians are, are just phenomenal, phenomenal actors. I think they, she's underrated. She can play the truth of a moment. And, she de- and she's so dedicated to that truth that she'll go to these comedic ele- elements. I think sometimes in a superhero movie, you need that kind of like willingness to go places. That's why they cast all these like Shakespearean actors from England to play villains in Marvel movies because they're used to like I can I can the sound ridiculous and be yeah. and be convincing. I, I feel like this is a perfect kind of role for Kristen Wiig. I think she has the ability to create one of the best villains of all time. Movie wise, going big. I'm going big. Which do you I know anything I don't, about Cheetah? I, do. I don't know anything about this character. Yeah, so uh, pretty much the character stumbles upon a cheese factory and creates the, what are known as the Puff Cheetos. <laughs> this is actually the, the Cheetos movie that they're making. This is Cheddar's wife. This is, Ch- <laughs> this is Cheddar's wife. This is before Cheddar, Cheddar made Sally or whatever her name is. And they, they, they start their establishment and whatnot. I have absolutely no idea. She's a <laughs> Cheetah, I guess. I have yeah. no idea. Cool. Uh, so... The Obamas may be coming back soon, but not in a <laughs> presidential sense. Nah, you're wrong they with that. are <laughs> developing some shows with Netflix, maybe. Uh, there's been rumors going around that Netflix is meeting with the Obamas to develop uh, a couple different specials or talk shows that would be centered around the different interests that Barack and Michelle Obama have. There's talk of a, uh, a healthy eating type of talk show that Michelle Obama would host. Barack Obama would host specials on different topics and talk to different speakers. Art. That's cool. Yay or nay? Yeah, that's cool. I feel you like that's You want to see an Obama people... show? Yeah. Is yeah. this on Netflix? And, like, no one's forcing you to watch it? Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing that would have been appropriate, been inappropriate while they were in office, but now Which they're kind of... 
doing a lot of people thing. complained about because Obama, without a doubt, was one of the coolest presidents. Whether you liked him or you didn't, that's fine. Policy, yeah. whatever else. But he was cool. Yeah. Shows that's up what on people, Funny or Die and stuff. That's what people complained about. They're like, oh, he's president. Why is he doing that? It's ironic. Not to get too political here because I think every site is dumb. But it's ironic that, right, he can he does the Funny or Die thing while he's president and he's being lazy. Go play golf. <laughs> oh, no, that's presidential. Uh, dude, I don't know. I, I, I think he was a cool person, so to see him now after doing yeah. this, if the complaint was that, yeah, that's fine, but he shouldn't be doing that when he's president, well, now he's not. Yeah, I mean, again, going off that like idea that you were talking about, him being the one of the cooler presidents, he's, without a doubt, one of the more charismatic political people yeah. that we've had. Mm -hmm. You know, he, you can listen to him talk. He can deliver a he's joke. He's genuine, yeah. He, he's like... Stand-up comedians have talked about how he's great at joke delivery. Seth Meyers talks about Dude, this. he's so funny to impersonate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, I feel like he, they are very media-friendly in terms of, you know, they could be on camera, they can do yeah. interviews I'll, and stuff. I hope it doesn't get too out of hand. Yeah, I mean, you uh, know. Because I, I, like, I like how proper they come out. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I think there's an, an idea that you can, necess you can maybe, like, be undignified by taking a TV show. Exactly. And I just have a feeling that they wouldn't. You know, I, I don't think they'd attach themselves to something that isn't classy. And you know that Netflix... That's what I'm talking about, exactly. Netflix is going to, like, do what they have to to make the right type of, type of creative decisions to facilitate that. So I think it could be something really interesting. And knowing the president's interests, hopefully something that's also educational to a lot of people. So here's the question. Do you think they're going to get over 500 grand? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know they'll get Shonda Mundy. I, I don't know if they'll get Ryan Murphy money. The Obamas, Ryan Murphy, Ryan Murphy, the Obamas, I don't know. Okay, let's move on to the rough cuts. A couple quick hit news segments before our topic of the week. First up, there it might be a Call Me By Your Name sequel in development. Luca Guadagnino is mm. apparently already conceiving the idea with uh, Andre Aximan. Uh, the writer of the novel, I think, right? Yeah, sure. And apparently Army Hammer and Timmy Chalamet are down to reprise their characters years later. Art Yerne. No. <laughs> but I will say this, a little, little note right here to rough it. Did you, guys, did you know that uh, Army Hammer's shorts were so short? His balls were, this is for real, his balls were sticking out of his shorts. <laughs> they had to And, his, and they had a CGI, his balls. Y'all been making fun of Superman? For CGIing out his mustache hair, they CGI out other hair and call me by your name. That's funny. But no to a sequel. Um, I'm going to go yay just because it, I could see it being kind of like a before sunset, after sun, before sunrise, kind of like we it see each other once ending. every 10 years. Yeah, yeah. But Is it a video? Well, not if you see him again. I, I think it could be cool. I don't know. We haven't seen something like it. You're just opposing me, whatever. <laughs> Michael B. Jordan's company yes. announced that they'll be in, <laughs> including inclusion riders. This is after the Francis McDormand uh, oh, yes. Oscar announcement. Explain. Can you please explain? Uh, in case. So what people, if you don't know what an inclusion rider is, this is the thing that Francis McDormand was talking about during her acceptance speech. It is a contract clause that you can have if you're signing up for a movie that says mm -hmm. you will only participate in the production if it meets certain diversity quotas. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm this curious is something about that, that Michael Jordan wants to have going forward <laughs> Jordan, in his Jordan, production. B. Jordan, B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan <laughs> wants to have going in his productions for uh, going forward. You know, I don't feel like cool. Michael B. Jordan is the type of person who'd be producing a lot of projects that necessarily mm -hmm. need this type of clause, but it's still like, it's about the precedent, you know, and I think, I think exactly. it's a good precedent to set. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be people who will misinterpret it, uh, but well, that's my thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm very like when the BAFTA rules came out. I'm just, I'm very curious. I'm just very curious. Like we talked about, what, what, what if these type of rules, this inclusion writer thing, forbids freaking? We were just talking about them. Cameraman, Jungle Book, Favreau oh, to not be a writer because the inclusion law would have been ah, well, he doesn't fit in. Do you get what I mean? That's right, what I'm talking right. about. I yeah, really and hope it does where, where that will ultimately sacrifice you know uh exactly it, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see if like this is gonna just hurt you know like working class mm -hmm. people and not necessarily the stars or the executive yeah. producers and I stuff mean, like that this is the way i'll put it timothy bro tim he writes he's right behind you man what if this hurts a future timothy yeah do you get what i mean because i know we're supposed to hate white guys and everything and i know 
I don't like you either, Zach. Yeah. But you know, there's like you said, there's the working people as well who can also put on good performances, and I hope it just doesn't get abused because I am all for it. I just hope it doesn't get abused. Like yeah. every movement, I hate the people who who try to abuse certain aspects of it. But yeah, but for now it seems like a good thing. So we'll uh, yeah. keep monitoring percent. it. Aladdin will have two songs written by Pasek and Paul. Art, yay or nay? You are now excited for Aladdin because the La La Land guys are contributing. Or excuse me, the Greatest Showman guys. <laughs> Yeah. Greatest Showman is the greatest movie last year. What are you talking about? Boy, that movie got love. I should have made a video on it. Oh, my God. I, I refuse to see that movie. What? I, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's just, not. There's it's something not. about... I don't need to see a musical about P.T. Barnum. Fuck, it's so weird, but there's something intriguing about it. I'm for real, watch it. Watch it drunk. Ugh. And our final rough cut. Uh, <laughs> Disney is apparently planning a Oscar push for Black Panther. Art, yay oh, yeah, or nay the, the, on its best picture chances? <laughs> chances. Sure. I let anything be nominated for best picture. I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it should. Because here's yeah, the thing. If we're talking Marvel movies, then, then Winter Soldier should have been. That was... that was. I don't even like Winter Soldier, but in, but in terms of like political movies, Winter Soldier was very political. We just didn't complain about Winter Soldier being political because... <laughs> Winter Soldier wasn't black. <laughs> he was he was Bucky, not Blackie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I'm gonna go nay on its chances. I I think it's gonna take a much, uh, much different kind of superhero movie to crack music for sure at the Oscars. Music, yeah. yo, if Dark Knight didn't even do it, they, they exactly they, it they, might they're get not, some nominations, but not like, Best Picture. Exactly. Even if I wanted it to, I just really don't think it will. Yeah. Not, put it for Best Picture. That's fine. You can submit anything for Best Picture. They exactly. submit Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, somebody will vote for it. Just yeah. probably not enough people. Anyway, we're going to move on to our topic of the week. But let us know if there are anything you have reactions to. You can leave us comments mm -hmm. down below. We always like hearing your opinions. Maybe uh, time code in the comments down below will help us know what you're Do talking you know what about. You're talking about. Yeah, because uh, sometimes you just leave. A, sometimes we get comments that... I don't really know what they're in reference to. Like, you yes, I agree. To something completely different. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> How dare you? Uh, so yeah, topic of the week time, and on this week's topic, March. Not a lot of good movies out, <laughs> are there? Bro, uh, this it is, is a new interesting. February. It's an interesting shift in the calendar where February, which had been known in recent years as the Dump graveyard for movies, is now getting some interesting releases. And January, which previously before that was the graveyard for movies, is also now getting mm -hmm. some interesting releases. So is March the new dumping ground for studios? And is there a reason for that? Or what are you, uh, what are you feeling? I think, uh, well, looking at it, January and February were always like the dumping grounds because there was so much Oscar push happening. Right, mm -hmm. and, and you can search up a bunch of uh, p uh, people, like actual people who are not producers and stuff who talk about pushing projects and stuff like that. Excuse me. So with the Oscar push and those movies being the center of attention and then having a month that for the majority of America is covered in snow, <laughs> January and February weren't really, movie, weren't really months where you can expect people to go outside that much, right? That's why you yeah, always see the blockbusters the in the summer, right? That mm -hmm. July 6th, 4th era, June, May being the big blockbuster month. As of recently, May used to be, the summers used to start in June. Then the summer started in May, as we saw with the Avengers and everything. Avengers is coming out now in April, mm -hmm. so they this is a little bit. This is a little bit to why March is kind of becoming a more dead ground because it needs to be the month right before the big ones come out. Exactly. So with January and February being the ones that that were the dumping grounds, we then see a shift between these two because. Uh, movies like random ones in January and it's not to say that there's not garbage in January and February there is there's garbage mm -hmm. actually all year round yeah. but what's it called Paddington right in, in, in February you get you get the, the surprise yeah. Valentine release so so I think like there's Deadpool been a, there's been an increase in these January like we don't really know what we have so we'll just put it out movies right and some of them kind of hit and a lot of them are like underrated like the things like Paddington and stuff like that. It's also but, late releases. 
Mm -hmm. Right, and as you get the expansion of the Christmas movies and stuff like that, there's still a lot of good options out there for you. Yeah, exactly. But then by February, a lot of them are leaving theaters, and Mm -hmm. they get sort of replenished. I mean, in the last couple of years, we've had this, like, coinciding with Black History Month thing of Black Panther and Get Out. Get Out. Uh, You know, a bunch of movies that are really, You're going to put respect on this month. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, but not only that, it's the Valentine's Day thing. I mean, It's a big one. You know, not that 50... I, I'm a fan of the Fifty Shades series, but those movies have all been making money by mm-hmm. coming out on the Valentine's Day weekend. And I think studios are seeing an opportunity there that there's a little bit of barren ground if you put something that people are going to get excited about. marketing Exactly, you know? Mm-hmm. Which is it's, Deadpool did great. Exactly. And that's kind of what I feel like is going on a little bit now and why we might see some shift to some... March releases next year is when you see an opportunity there there's a little bit of a dead spot right throwing something out there is going to get you more attention I mean you look at Black Panther now it's in its fourth week of release is still the number so one much movie money. It, it, there's a there's room for a movie to come in and exactly. take the attention away you see it uh, just to bring up some examples of it right so just looking at what came out this past weekend um, A Wrinkle in Time mm-hmm. The Strangers Hurricane Heist, Gringo, right? Like these types of movies are movies that clearly, uh, I'll give you two example. A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah. Right? There has to be a reason why they put it here. They're, they clearly made a lot of money with, with, with Black Panther, right? They, they had a lot writing on that. And you're going to see it when you see the new Avenger trailer come out. And guess who's going to be the spotlight? Yep, they know. They, they yeah. know how to market. They have... All these other projects coming out in April, May to really push that 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 uh, whole exchange of, hey, uh, which I don't know, did we mention it last week? The whole exchange between Marvel and uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, on Twitter, that whole like, a real exchange between Robert Downey Jr. and Marvel. Yeah, talking about like, hey, can you move it up for my friend? Sure, how about a week? Oh, that's perfect. Release it everywhere. It's really cool. It's it, that's a, that's a great way to market it. That's fine. Yeah. But there's no doubt that they didn't just move it to be like, oh, this is really cool. They moved it up for international reasons. They moved it up because Fox decided to release Deadpool. This is so cunning. Deadpool the week before, the week after Avengers before. Solo, I want yeah. to say, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So pushing it up gives them that extra week of cushion to, 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 keep, to keep the movie up money. there. I, exactly, because, you know, they're, they're aware as well that people, some people are going to go out there and, and, and use the money, but they also got to understand, they, they know that not everyone's got money to spend every single weekend. Exactly. So, so they got to build up a release, which is why I think March has become that one place where it's like, they were clearly banking on one, they released mm-hmm. it in February. That made it, so they know people still got to wait for the next check. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's worth so the March noting, one's getting skipped. Those studios never put out like banger after banger. Like when they know they've got one hit, they'll mm-hmm. space it out so they have they because they want all the money, money going quarter. to that one. Yeah, exactly. So now th- that's why I see the thing with a wrinkle in time for Disney. I see the thing for the Strangers and whatever company that is. I don't even know because if you can, you can search this up yourself. I know because I liked the original Strangers. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's a decent slasher film for what it was. I, I liked – that was when I really got into the idea of horror being the things where just someone pops up from the back. Right. I liked that. I really liked that, which is what Her- Hereditary does really great. It's coming out later this year. This movie got delayed, delayed, made, shelved, delayed, delayed. Company went bankrupt. It was the same – it was made by the same company who made Masterminds. Yeah. Remember that movie? Yeah. So when Not I see, a lot of people do. But. Exactly. So now that I see it come out in, in, in March, it shows me you guys clearly, like, it's out there. You clearly have this whole thing showing us, documented, that you didn't think this movie was going to make it. So whenever you release it, you're also telling me you don't think that's a good month. Now, regardless yeah. of it making money, because it is a very cheap horror movie, of course it makes money. Yeah, but. no, you can tell just by the way that critics are reacting to some of these movies that they're getting so ignored or panned that, that these are movies that... Studios know, like they're right. The studios, the studios themselves don't know. know. The studios don't aren't surprised when things get bad reviews. Exactly. That was That's another thing with they, Annihilation. It, Besides the critics, though, they knew it because of money. Yeah. Whenever this is how we knew that January and February were the bad months, you know, from the studio's perspective, because of when they themselves decided to release the movies. When you see the behind the scenes to everything that they have to say about the movie, and then you see when they dump it. 
then that tells you that the studio, the person, the people who actually have all the statistics, they know that this isn't a good month. Another one of the movies that's out there, um, Hurricane Heist. This was clearly a movie by like a little small studio. And again, this is the reason why like freaking five movies came out in one weekend. Five movies come out because they're all, they don't care about the competition. Yeah, they're just throwing stuff against the wall. Like, maybe something will work. Maybe, like, you know, exactly. Hurricane Heist could have been the number one movie this weekend if they Hurricane had, Heist like, the right kind of marketing behind Hur it. Hurricane Heist ain't that bad, first of all. <laughs> it, it, it's dumb. It, it ain't the worst movie that came out It knows it's week. dumb. Exactly. But when you see that they're very stiff on competition, moving up Avengers a week earlier, ain't no one making a shift for this March release, and all of them are like, this release. Thoroughbreds as well. And again, you brought up the critical thing, which is important, but... Thoroughbreds is critically acclaimed, but they know it's too niche to make that much money. Right, right. Is why it's get released here. Gringo, you, I, I ain't even talking about Gringo. <laughs> what do you think about, though, like, so Game Night is a movie that came out, I want to say it came out the tail end of February, or did it come out March? No, 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 February. That was February. that was almost, yeah, I think that was, Game Night was riding off of the uh, Valentine's thing thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's another one where... That one didn't make necessarily a whole lot of money, but mm. I think it got solid word of mouth and maybe lasted a little bit longer than people were expecting. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a studio being like, you know, maybe this will be our secret set February yes. hit. But then Black, <laughs> Black Panther Black just Panther. took up all the oxygen in the room. Oh, it took more than that, yeah. Black, <laughs> Black Panther broke records. Like, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, but no, I feel you. That that's dumb taking more chances. I'm looking over here again. Uh, March Pacific Rim. That was a movie that that got delayed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Midnight Sun, get out of here. Uh, let me see. There was another one that I that I had. Do you feel like March is going to continue then to be this kind of like graveyard, or will we see this continued shifting? I mean, you know, it March really is always not. kind of going to be like the month before it gets warm. So it's not like we can exactly. really you gotta prep. Much. Yeah. You got to prep. Um, I'm not going to say that it's because again, bad movies come out all the time. Yeah. But I just feel like the, the beginning part of March is a little bit of a dumping ground flower. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't judge it, but I'm talking in terms of the studio, right? Yeah. It's not like the studio wanted to release bad movies in January and February, but they were releasing the movies that the, They've they weren't as confident, something. exactly, and they out of the ones, you know, the filmmaker isn't making a movie going, I can't wait for this to come out in January, which is right. known as a dumping ground. They're making a movie and the studio goes, we're picking this one instead for the big release date. You want yours released? It's coming out then. Of course you're going to be happy with it. You yeah. have to. You see this sometimes with like the major, major movies too, where something will get planned for Christmas and then it's like, ah, uh, well, it didn't yeah. really turn out the way we wanted. Let's push it to February. Exactly. Yes. I, I was looking at what, like Flower. Again, I haven't seen it, but that was one that it's a lot of delayed movies that end up coming out. Yeah. Another another month that may be the new February, January. This is another big one. And I've, whew, last couple of years have been big. August. I was going to bring right? that up. Right? Because tells... last year, August was a big dead space. No, it was August basically is a, all the movies offensive. that all the movies that seemed like they cost maybe more than twenty million, but people knew they wouldn't make their money back. Bro, I still I was probably two years ago. Transport the transporter one, <laughs> that Vin Diesel yeah. witch one. Like a lot of movies that were like, all right, yeah, we're gonna let you do your little like fan project or whatever it was, but it's being released in August, and like no one in August. They're either all on vacation or something. They, there's obviously a statistic that they've seen that August makes the, le the least amount of money. Yeah. I but mean, you also... mentioned that thing about people who just don't have enough money to go every single week. Oh, after July, by you're poor. <laughs> yeah, by, by the end of the summer, you've seen all the big blockbusters. I mean, there's this race to get them out early and earlier. And, exactly. you know, now it's gonna, we're going to get to the end of May and we'll already have Avengers, Deadpool, and Solo, you know? So it, it's tough when it's tough if you're uh, trying to... Keep people going to the movies all the way through August. Exactly. So I mean, and and then August is right before you get all the uh, all the awards push. Award yeah. season starts coming out, and you want those prestigious films. And again, like we said, because then what's the next big thing? After August, it ain't September. It ain't October. That's where your little horror movies come out, right? Mm -hmm. It's November. Yeah. Where you get the Avatars, the Cocos, the Moanas, those big movies, the Justice Leagues, the <laughs> movies that they want to to start getting that ride. 
right? Because everyone's with their families or whatever for the holidays. And of course, the best place when you don't want to speak to your family members, let's go watch a movie for three hours. Right. Kill the time. Right. And it's true. Avatar is the highest grossing movie of all time. When did that come out? November. Yeah. So, th- so there's that building period to it, which is why August is also... Iffy. Yeah, it, it is kind of interesting to me that, you know, it's both the tail end of the cold months and the tail end of the warm months. Mm. You know, it's this like, uh, we Weatherman don't know Zach. what to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you your six month forecast. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's this thing of like, the, almost like the studios are so eager to put stuff out that they, they run out of steam by the end. And they, maybe yeah. it's just that the audiences run out of, out of steam, so the studios know how to treat us. Um, but it, it's interesting, and I wonder whether or not this is like where Netflix's move is or where Amazon's move is. Where if they know like people hey. aren't going to the movies there, maybe Somebody's that's asked. where you need your hey. like, blockbusters to drop. Oh, I didn't even think of that. We're all over here focused on the, we're focused on the box office and the theater, and Netflix over here going like, hey, hey, hey. opportunity. We, we got the statistics too. Yeah, <laughs> they're gonna release Bright Two in August. Watch. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that that would be a good play. That would be a good play though. That would yep. be very interesting. Because you ain't gotta leave the house. Exactly. So and it's not, not like people aren't interested in entertainment. It's just like if the options aren't good or you're running out of money or, you know, like at, with with mm-hmm. the thing you were mentioning about August, a lot of people are on vacation. March, too. A lot Ooh. of people have spring break. I was about, we should have a podcast together. We should have a podcast. <laughs> Bro, I was about to say that when you're on the go, you can't just stop and be like, hold on, let me just hit this AMC for two and a half hours plus 25 <laughs> minutes of commercials. You can't. Can, yeah, but, can, you, can you binge an entire show on the plane? Totally. Can you, you go- watch a Netflix movie at the end of the night? Can you drive to Hawaii while you're watching Love Season 3? Of course. <laughs> yeah. It's so much easier than, than, again, having to stop and go to a theater. It's You have it on your phone. So, right. hey, that is definitely that's definitely a market that, that they're going to be able to jump on. Yeah, you should call them Netflix. Already man. jumping on. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have any more thoughts on this whole vacant period we're getting in March? Uh, do you think it's going to change soon, I guess? Uh, no, I just see it expanding, especially with August. I've seen that 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 growing and growing and growing. Mm-hmm. I saw the push. I I want to say from January to February, and then with Valentine's Day being so big, I've seen right. it be like the last week or two of February to March. So I just feel it's those periods. Yeah, that come out, and it's not to say that a good movie can't come out. It's not to say that at all. Totally. But it's to say that statistically and what the studio is thinking, right? Mm-hmm. The studio didn't think that Annihilation would make that much money. Yeah, that that's mean why they release it. A bad but, movie, exactly. But it does mean that it's gonna be very polarizing, though, mm-hmm. right? It does mean that a movie like A Wrinkle in Time. It does mean that a movie like The Strangers and these other ones that were shelved. It just shows you the studio's perspective. So just look back at previous months and just mm-hmm. go, should I save my money until April? Yeah. And I think that's definitely uh, a possibility, and probably more likely that we'll we'll continue with this sort of cycle. But I think there's something to note about. All the expansion some of these studios are doing. And you look at a company like Disney, which maybe in another year they wouldn't have bothered to put A Wrinkle in Time in March. But now they have so many movies coming out. They have Avengers and they have Solo Mm -hmm. and they have, you know, they've all these Star Wars and all these Marvel things and just whatever else they want to put out too. Disney has so many big movies coming out. They might just have to start putting big movies in March too. Mm -hmm. They're not looking they're not looking to, to make money. They're looking to break records. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Um, I think a lot of this switch to putting, like, maybe we can get a lot of money on this movie uh, came when 300 made a lot of money a few years ago. Who? The the Zack Snyder movie. Because 300 came out March 9th, and I remember it making way, way more money than people expected it to. Like, something like 70 million opening weekend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think since then we've been seeing more and more of these like random outcast movies pop up and make a lot of money early in the year. Mm-hmm. Hey, you never know. It's just how they play it. Yeah. Pretty much get Movie Pass, and you can watch <laughs> anything and don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Th- you don't have to commit extra money to it. Yeah. That's Until how they I saw. You. That's how I saw Wrinkle. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you canceled now? Are you? Bro, on they movie canceled pass? me a long time ago, right? And and a lot, I heard a lot of people. You guys. Ooh, you guys are so full of it. Yeah, it's because you misuse it. I have all the receipts. 
we don't believe you. Report comes out of like elderly ladies saying we were canceled out of movie pass and what they they weren't upset that they didn't have the service. They were upset for being called liars. Yeah. And movie pass said, No, you ruined the, the terms of service and they're like, Well show us or like actually no our contract says we don't have to prove anything. So <laughs> boom. Yeah. At least. I am a suspicious individual, but but don't offend those old ladies. There was like a, a chunk of them, a yeah. chunk of movie pass people were gone. And I told you guys, but even then, I'm still giving them the benefit of the doubt. Because for nine bucks, boy, <laughs> how much did you pay though? Uh, I, I paid before they did the yearly thing, so I'm, <sighs> I'm doing the nine ninety five. Good. That was some. Mm, I, Just yeah, I don't want to get was, canceled on. Yeah. I I'm only gonna pay them nine ninety five to sell mm-hmm. all my data. <laughs> Waited until he took a sip for that. Uh, so we move on to our last segment, the new to see, talking about what's new in theaters, VOD, and streaming. Starting with March 16th, in big theaters, we get Tomb Raider. This is the reboot, revamp, sequel, or whatever have you, with Alicia Vikander, Dominic West, and Walton Goggins. Uh, I think this one looks like it's more based on the newer games that came out. Less, less of like the sultry Lara Croft, more of the adventure. Yeah. Explorer. Uh, double A, less double. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> double uh, A but, games. Tri- it's, I, think, I think it's triple A games. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's. I, I like Alicia Vikander a lot. I mean, I like I'm Alicia hoping, too. I'm hoping this is a good role for her. I don't really. No, I, franchise. I, nothing, nothing that I've seen makes me think she's like an action star, but maybe she could be. I'm excited for it, but the biggest thing is that we always say this with video games. When people go, "Wow, why wasn't it as good as video?" Because you get to play the video game, yeah, bro. Like when you different, die, completely different experiences. Yeah, when you die in the video game, that tension will never be there in the movie because you know that you still got more time in the movie. In the game, you do know that there's more of the game, but you die in the game. Yeah. Right? If you slip, then you got to try it all over again. They ain't rewinding the movie and showing it to you. It's, it's a psychological ex- difference yeah. between a game and a movie. That's why. The other movies out in theaters this weekend, Love, Simon. This is a good. gay, dramedy, comedy, romance story. Yeah. Uh, Seven Days in Entebbe. This is with Rosamund what Pike and this? Daniel Bruhl. Yeah. And Flower, uh, which we brought up briefly. Mm-hmm. This one has Zoe Dutch, Catherine Hahn, Adam Scott, and Dylan Galula, or... Yeah, Galula. That's how you pronounce it. Uh, I thought Dylan Galula was really good in this movie. I caught oh, it you last saw it? year at Tribeca. Look at uh, you. Yeah, I'm a little bit ahead of this you in this one. I thought this was pretty delightful. I thought Zoe Dutch was really good in it. I like her. Uh, yeah, I think she's a really good actress, and this is a great performance for her. Really gives her a chance to kind of show a snarky side, and and it, not really too different from most of the other roles I that I've seen her in. But <laughs> she's been on that since On Deck. What are you talking about? <laughs> but it's a it's a you know, it's a prominent role for her. I will say that I feel like it's a worse version of The End of the Fucking World. Ooh. But I'll leave it at that. Ooh. You said you saw Love, Simon? I saw Love, Simon. Saw it a couple of weeks ago. I, I actually, I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. It does have its cheesiness factor to it. But I like the way that when, when something happens between the friendships and stuff, they don't just go, "Ah, oh, well, it's okay. We get it. You were gay. No, they go, brah, no. That is, a, that is a bad thing to do as a human being. That is, I don't care if you're gay. That is a bad thing. And I'm like, <laughs> not when they, you know when they sugarcoat something, right? And it's like right. some person's being like a dick and then they go, oh, no, but you have this and this is what we need to support. I was like, brah, they're being raw and honest here. So with all of that, I was like, all right, I'm digging it. I'm enjoying it. The biggest thing is him trying to solve like who his pen pal is kind of as well as him coming out. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't like the I don't like the ending. There's something in the ending I just didn't like, and I don't want to spoil it. But I think it's very manipulative. I think it's disrespectful for the people who came to watch the movie. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so the other big gay movie out there is Call Me by Your Name, but those are like very different movies. Oh, no, stop. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the difference, right? It, it's like when we're talking about Black Panther and A Wrinkle in Time. Right. One's this action movie, right? That's still black leads, black filmmakers, and the mm-hmm. other one is a kid's movie with a black girl. It's a different perspective. So Calling By Your Name obviously is the better film in my opinion, but that's also like an yeah. artsy film. It's an art house film. They're this going is, for completely different things. Exactly. This is like that teen drama, you know, not CW, but for the CW crowd. But that, <laughs> okay. that's why. It's the ending is very CW when the rest of the movie wasn't. And mm. I was like, oh. 
I'll, I'll explain it to you later, but yeah. I'm curious. I, I do recommend it, though. New to streaming, kind of a light week in your streaming options. New to Netflix on March 16th, Wild Wild Country. This is a series about a cult leader in Oregon, I believe it was, in the 80s, a docu-series that's supposed to be cool. It's got some twists and turns in it. On Hulu, March 16th, John Q. I kind of like that movie, uh, the Denzel movie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. From, like, 2005? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, It's Denzel. Yeah, good dad, Denzel. Yeah, Yeah, I remember that movie. You know, uh, Denzel is... takes a hospital Host- yeah, hostage, hostage because he wants a trans- Yo, heart no, no, no. transplant for his son. Yo, uh, it's, this, this is a good movie. Yeah, I remember yeah. this movie. I liked this movie a lot when I was younger. So it's on Hulu on March 16th. And then on HBO Now or Go, March 17th, The Beguiled, the recent Sofia Coppola one dope, with dope, dope, dope. Uh, Kirsten Dunst, uh, Nicole Kidman, Elle Fanning, Colin Farrell. Phantom uh, Thread like 2.0. Uh, never saw it. Oh, no? Phantom. Yeah, it, I, Phantom Thread 2.0 some, is what I heard. <laughs> it has some weird similarities to Phantom Thread. Not as I good have, as Phantom Thread. Okay, good. I've been wanting to see it, though. It's actually, like, a, a big top of my list. I just, I missed it. There were so many movies I needed to catch up with last year, and this was, like, literally a handful. This was mm-hmm. one of them, sadly. Yeah. So, it's coming out? New to VOD on March 13th. Call Me By Your Name, Ferdinand, I, Tanya, Justice League, The Shape of Water. I think... Star Wars The Last Jedi, although I saw some conflicting information about that. And if The Disaster Artist isn't already available on VOD, it's definitely available now. So a lot of VOD options available, including some Oscar-nominated stuff there. Like Ferdinand. <laughs> yes, Ferdinand at the top of that list. Art, what are you going with with your pick of the week? For my pick of the week, I am going with um, Love. I started re-watching it, so I cool. can't necessarily say season three. And I can't say that it's better than another recommendation that I know you love, and, and I still haven't caught up with season two. Uh, easy. It's not better than easy. Yeah. Like, I still feel easy. Easy still surprises me, man. This is yeah. me kind of slipping in easy, even though I recommended it in the past. <laughs> um, but no, I, I've been catching up on love, and I think it gets better. I'm a oh, big... Oh, yeah? Yeah. So... Because uh, I was a little bit mixed on the first season. Same. I yeah. think it gets a little bit better. So I, I'm watching it right now, and I hear that season three gets even more superior, right? But uh, right now I'm like, okay, I'm having fun with it, so, so I'm having a good time. So I would definitely say that if you want to go out to the theater, out of the picks from this past week, it's very hard for me to say like any of like Wrinkle, Definitely Not Strangers, Hurricane yeah. Heist is fun but too dumb. I'm going to have to go with Thoroughbreds, but that is only if you want to see something new. Caught this one, not this past, on two Sundances ago. I remember seeing it. It was very interesting Q&A. Guy writes plays. He decided to turn this into a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Antoine's really good in this. Yeah, Antoine Antoine's final, yeah. Y- final it's, film. It's so weird, though. Yeah. With what happens in the It's just so weird. But the yeah. performances from both leads... Fan freaking tastic. Mm-hmm. Olivia the, Coleman and Anya Taylor Joy. Yes. I love both those actresses. Performances make it way more than the movie does. That's yes. what I remember. Now, I don't really care what happens in the movie. On for me. I uh, yeah. I mean I. But the performances. I was a little less into this movie, I think, than you were. I think it had a really interesting premise and then kind of didn't go very far with oh, it. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, but there's a lot of interesting moments and really, really good acting in this it's one. It's the performance. I think if you like any of those three actors, you might be interested in checking out this yeah, for that reason. Uh, movie for that reason. So, yeah, Thoroughbreds is a good pick. I'm going to go with... A Wrinkle in Time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm gonna go with Disaster Artist. You know, oh, I mean, VOD, yeah, thousand percent. It, yeah, it, if it's available on VOD, then you should definitely catch up with it if you haven't seen it yet. You know, I think there's some people who uh, kind of unfairly dismissed the movie. A little okay, bit. have we? Have you heard about this? Yeah, yeah. The there's been ending like this, is so fake and it's so manipulative. There's oh, this it's weird so like backlash to the movie. It's that, weird. Yeah, and like, yes. It's not like an amazing, amazing film, but there's so much that it does well, and how it made me laugh more than any other movie in 2017. So mm-hmm. for that alone, I would recommend it just on a com- comedic level. But uh, what, like we've talked about previously on the show, I think the film actually subtly does some things that are really interesting in the way that it shows how collaborative film is. Oh, you that know, part, yeah, yeah. A lot of times. Not? A lot of times we get this idea that it's really like an auteur-driven format. It's like, yeah, this one guy's Guillermo amazing vision. Guillermo did it vision. all. Yeah, no, and no, no, you, no. And you see in this, like, it's really like you got to work with people and not 
insult them. <laughs> Here's what happens when you do. Than the room. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, check out the Disaster Artist on VOD, or check out Itania. Uh, that's a movie that Art and I actually caught in uh, Brooklyn. That's right. Yeah, here. we did. Yeah, it was good. Uh, Very great performance. Solid movie. One of the better Oscar-nominated movies out there. So that's all for this week's show. You can catch more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter or on Instagram or wherever, at Z Shevich. And go check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash multiplex show. Art, where can people catch more from you? You can find me at The A to Z Show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but also over at youtube.com. I'm trying to get more uploads, probably like I'm trying to get to three, but I've been steady with the two. Got some ones on uh, Logic coming out this week. Got one on this YouTube conspiracy I've been working up and cooking up. Ooh. I had one on the Boss Baby. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Please Boss make Baby it. explained. <laughs> the theories and the symbolism of Boss Baby. I don't Boss know. Baby explains life explained. Exactly. Life explained. <laughs> Life explained by Boss life Baby. explained through Boss Baby, something like that. It's gonna be a forty-five minute analysis of the film, but uh, yeah, you can head on over there if you want to talk about stuff over there. But if you want to see both of us together, you can stay right here. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on Apple Podcasts, on SoundCloud, on whatever podcatcher you desire. We got them all We're using that RSS feed. It's gonna be in there. Mm-hmm. I use uh, Overcast. I like that one. So be- I just take uh, the audio we already have. <laughs> So be sure to subscribe to us there and subscribe to us on YouTube. Hopefully you're watching yeah. our bright, sunny, smiling faces for you here on YouTube at youtube.com slash C slash intercut pod. You can find the video episodes with mm-hmm. graphics and all that stuff. Get a little bit more of a dynamic, a work enhanced goes into podcast experience because yeah. We put in all that work for you guys so you can enjoy this one every Tuesday here on Intercut. Make sure you're checking us out. Also, like our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, they're all at Intercut Pod. You can get updates from both of us throughout the week. You can check all of those places. But that does it for this week's show. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, remember, Jesse Thorne has a signature sign-off. You don't know that reference. You don't know that reference. No. Pop rocket.